Good morning, everyone. It is just wonderful. I got a few good mornings. There we go. Um, I want to take another moment to continue in this uh, attitude of prayer. It's good when we're together uh, to be praying together for what is on God's heart and what's on our hearts. And we did on both campuses, wanted to take a moment as we gather this morning to pray for our communities and our nation as we are heading into election day on Tuesday. If you have filled out one of our connect cards and are on our email list, you get updated on what's going on here, but you also get communication from us. And uh, if you're part of that, you would have gotten a letter from our lead pastor, Joe, last night, uh, just encouraging us on how to think about heading into this week. And I really appreciate his leadership and his reminder to trust God no matter what happens, that we trust him, that we pray no matter what, and that we depend on him, and that we love no matter what. And I love those uh, encouragements that this is uh, a reminder that no matter what happens, and we all will have different opinions about what we hope will happen this week, but at the end of the day, no matter what our country chooses, we have this beautiful and wonderful reality that we serve the Lord of the nations, who is sovereign and can be trusted, and that we submit to his care and to his guidance in that. And so we are people who know elections matter, but they're not ultimate. That God and his leadership over our nation is ultimate. And so we wanted to turn to him, so could you just join me in prayer for that? God, I thank you that you are not just a God who sees our uh, the small things in our hearts, but you also guide and lead the destiny of nations, that you are the creator of nations, you're the king of the nations. And God, we together just ask that you would continue to lead and guide this nation. God, we trust you and how you're going to lead and guide this nation. God, we pray for peace. We pray for peace over this nation. God, we pray that the people of God would not be led by fear, but that we would be led by faith and trust in you. God, we pray that who, whatever the outcome is, that you would bless that person, give them wisdom, give them insight. We trust your ability to do that with no matter who is elected. And there's peace in that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that. So, who you are and what your identity is matters a lot. We talk about that a lot. I had an identity situation many years ago in my early 20s. I was in the nation of India for three months. And I had spent the first couple of months in the city of Calcutta, one of the biggest cities in the world. I was working with a home called Kaligat, the home for the destitute and dying, which was started by Mother Teresa and was working there caring for destitute and dying people. And after that time, I, me and my coworkers moved out and were going into some smaller towns. Now in India, small town is still a big town. And we would go into villages and smaller towns and we're doing some work in those areas with Mother Teresa's uh, homes. And I would be walking down the street or in kind of marketplace squares in these towns in India, and I would find myself, and did find myself in a situation where a family, an Indian family, came up to me and said, excuse me, ma'am, could we take our picture with you? And I was like, say what? And they're like, could, could we take our picture with you? And I had to, on the, like right there in the instant, be like, uh, okay. And so they're like, great, and they all get around me, and I'm like, you know, like this. And we take, and they take a picture, and I was like, that was really weird. And the people I was with were like, what the heck? I was like, I have no idea, but I am now in an Indian family's photo album for the rest of their life. And then a few days passed, and someone else would come up to me, another family, and then another family, and then another family. Repeatedly, people would come and ask to have their picture taken with me. I thought, I just radiate such a fantastic personality that clearly, you know, 
they want their picture taken. Finally, this must have been like the ninth or tenth person, this young couple comes up to me and says the same thing. Could we have our picture taken with you? And at this point, I was like, sure. So we do the picture, and afterwards, the wife pulls out a pen and paper and says, and could I have your autograph too? And I was like, oh, what would you like me to write? And she said, just write anything. I just, I just want you to know I love the Titanic movie and you were the best. <laughs> it was in that moment that I realized that she thought I was Kate Winslet. <laughs> and that I had been taking pictures with many, many Indian people who also thought I was Kate Winslet. Now, I was out in like smaller towns and villages, and so they don't see a lot of white people. And when you don't see a lot of a certain ethnic group, they kind of all look the same to you. So they thought, because I can guarantee you, I did not look like Kate Winslet. There was nothing about me that looked like Kate Winslet. But to them, all white people looked the same. Clearly, I was Kate Winslet. Now, my coworkers, actually, it was my birthday around that time, and as a joke, they uh, got me a Titanic t-shirt because the Titanic movie was out at that time. And I actually stupidly wore it out in public one day, which only made it worse. <laughs> because clearly Kate Winslet would wear a Titanic t-shirt if she was wandering around <laughs> India, as we all know. But I thought about that. I was like, man, if I was Kate Winslet, that would be absolutely fabulous. I would have a much better accent than the one that I have now because she has a beautiful English accent. But my whole life would be different and everything about me would be different. And they were looking for these markers. They were looking for, at me, trying to decide who I was. And it reminded me of that when we think about the book of John and the Gospel of John. We are teaching through the Gospel of John right now. And the Gospel of John is a different account of the life of Jesus than the other three Gospels. There are four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Gospel of John is unique. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of just go through the story of John. They were, go through the story of Jesus. They were all written around the same time, but John was written much later and was not written in a way where it's just like, telling a story and just saying, I'm just trying to give you an account of the life of Jesus. It was a very, written in a very specific way in order to not just tell the story of Jesus, but to tell you the reality of Jesus' identity. And if you look at the Gospel of John, it was not even written in chronological order. The events are all out of order. And everything that John includes there are written for a specific purpose. John actually says this because in this gospel, he gives seven miracles. We know all the gospels include miracles. John gives precisely seven of them. And then he also goes, and if you like order and design, he also goes and he has seven I am statements of Jesus. This is where we get Jesus saying, I am the light of the world or I am the bread of life. There's seven of them. And he gives them specifically because he doesn't want you just to be impressed by the miracles or these accounts so we can say, wow, look what Jesus can do. He says that he writes these down for a reason. Let's look at John chapter 2, verse 11. This is after the first miracle where Jesus turns water into wine, which we're going to look at this morning. John ends that story saying this, the first of his signs... Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John says, I am writing down this miracle because it is a sign or a signpost pointing you to believe in who Jesus is. He actually ends the book, John chapter 20, reminding that this is exactly what he is doing. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31 says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. So John could have written much more than seven, but he chose these seven for a specific reason. He says he, could, he did many other, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
These miracles are signposts. They are signals that we are not supposed to be impressed with the miracle. We are supposed to look at what they are pointing us to or who they are pointing us to and they tell us something about who Jesus is. Because Jesus' identity changes everything about who Jesus is and changes everything about who you are and what he can do for you. So we're going to look at the first of these signs this morning, and that is the wedding at Cana. Let's look in John chapter 2. And read this together. It says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited. I love that. Mary was there, and they're like, Yeah, Jesus, you can come too. Sorry. I love the Bible. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called to the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here we are, and we have a wedding feast. And now weddings were not just a two or three hour affair. Weddings were different in the early first century. They were week long events. Your whole family and community would come to it. And the purpose of a wedding was not for everybody to focus on the bride or groom. The purpose of a wedding in first century Middle Eastern culture was for the families to bless their families and their community, to host them, to show a big party, to show what sort of family that they are. And they would serve food and they would serve wine, but this was the purpose. And so in this story, the family runs out of wine, and this is significant because it is hugely embarrassing. Now, we come to a wedding to focus on the bride and groom. It would be like for us to show up at a wedding uninvited in sweatpants without a gift. We just wouldn't do it. It would be embarrassing, right? Although we are a casual culture. Maybe you would do this, but... <laughs> but this is, this is not what was done. And so the family is feeling this. And Jesus' mom sees an opportunity. She knows who he is. She's the first one who knew because the angels revealed to her when she was still pregnant with him. She knew exactly who he was. And you get the sense that his mom, Mary, is like looking for an opportunity for him to show off, for him to show that he's not just the son of Mary and Joseph. He is someone different. And so she kind of turns to Jesus and says, hey, you're going to do something about this? And Jesus says, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then Jesus does what Jesus always does. He takes an ordinary moment and turns it into an extraordinary opportunity to reveal something about himself. He says to them, go get the jars for purification. It actually says they were stone jars. Now, these stone jars were unique jars. They were only used for purification. All other jars for everyday use were clay, but stone jars were used for the Jewish rites of purification. When a guest would have showed up to the wedding festival, they would have had water poured over their hands and feet in order not just to make them clean and kind of freshen up for the party, but to make them ceremonially, religiously clean, to cleanse them from their sins. It was a religious ritual that dealt with the sins and the shame that they had and the the impurity that they were carrying from the sins that they had committed. 
And they fill it up. They couldn't fill it up with just any water. They don't just go to a well or a pond and fill it up. They had to fill it up with specific water, water from a moving source, a stream or a river that was moving. It had to be moving water because this was considered the clean water that could do this ritual of making people clean. The Jews called it, by a specific name, they called it living water. Living water was the type of water you put in jars for purification. And they fill it up and it turns into wine. It turns into wine. And not just any wine. They didn't pull out the two buck chuck for the end of this party. It was the best wine. I know some of you know what two buck chuck is. It was the best wine. Now there is a signal. Was Jesus just showing off like, look at me, look at us, a party trick. I can turn water into wine. Nope. He is showing them what, something specific about himself. This is, remember, these are signs so that we will believe in Jesus. And the first signal was when he told Mary, what does this have to do with me? His next words were, my hour has not yet come. And there was a signal that he didn't turn the water into anything else but wine, that they would pour into cups for people to drink. Now, if there are two symbols in the New Testament and in the Gospels of Jesus' death, it would be the hour and the wine. When Jesus went to Gethsemane, he said, my hour has now come. When he was on the cross, he says, Father, take this cup from me. For Jesus, his hour and to drink the cup of wine was for him to die. And so in this moment, this was a sign and the disciples knew exactly what he was doing and they saw it and they believed. What did they believe? They believed this, that the jars of purification, the human rituals that cleanse us and make us clean, the jars and religious symbols, the routines that we go through to deal with the guilt and shame that we carry because of what we have done or undone has gone away because it never worked in the first place, because something new has come. And the thing that truly makes us clean, the thing that truly purifies us is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. We have a sin problem. We have a wrongdoing problem. And that wrongdoing doesn't just make us guilty before God and before men. That wrongdoing, that sin, causes a sense in us that we are unclean and we need to be purified. You need to be purified and made clean, and Jesus can do it. Now, we live in a culture where this is difficult. We live in a culture where we don't like that sort of language. Maybe we're a little comfortable with wrongdoing, a little bit comfortable with sin, definitely not comfortable with the concept of I need to be cleansed or I need to be purified. We live in a culture that says that is what makes people feel guilty. That is the problem is telling people that they are somehow needing to be purified. We need to escape that sort of religious thinking. But make no mistake, you and I need to be cleansed and need to be purified. I want you to do a short little mental exercise with me. Just imagine, suspend belief or reality for a moment, just imagine for one moment that everything you have thought, every thought, every brief moment, everything that's gone through your head, in the past years made completely public. Just sit with that for a second. How does that feel? How would that feel to you if that was true? Every single one of your thoughts in the last 365 days is now publicly available for everyone to see, read, and know. What coworkers do you not want to see? That with family members or spouse. That feeling that we feel inside, I believe is that God put in feeling that we know that we sin. We know that feeling of embarrassment and a little bit of shame, like, oh, 
Definitely not from June because that was a bad month. Right? We know instinctually, even if you don't believe in God, you know instinctually there is this right and wrong and you have not lived by it, even if it's your own standards. And you wouldn't want people to see it. So we have ways around this. We have ways around that discomfort because we don't like sin and we think saying people need to be purified and made clean somehow oppresses them instead of frees them. So we have ways around that. And we have these modern approaches to sin. I want to look at that briefly. One way around that that we can try to deal with that is we can deny sin. This is when we say, you know what? Sin doesn't exist. You do you. You're basically a good person. Just live your life. Why do these religious Christians tell people they need to live a certain way? Just let's let everybody live their life. And that may feel appealing for a brief moment, but nobody actually believes that we can just deny sin to deal with that feeling that we have. No one actually believes that. No one wants to live with anyone who actually believes that. That there's no right and wrong. That just let people do what they want to do. Do you want to live with someone like that? No. And we don't want to live in a world like that. Because you can't tell someone to stop doing something if you believe they should just live their life. You can't stand against sexual abuse if you think that people should just follow their hearts. We can't protest against injustice on Monday and then on Tuesday say, but let's just let everyone be themselves. We know intrinsically there has to be a standard. There has to be. And so we know that's not true. So then we turn to this. We can redefine sin. And this is when we say sin doesn't exist or does exist, but I get to decide what it is and what it's not. Let's just let people come up with their own standards. Or maybe I do believe sin exists, but I'm going to kind of redefine it because the Bible is really old and kind of like from a different culture and it doesn't apply to today. And so we redefine it, which won't help you in the ways you think it'll help you and won't make this world a better place in the way you think it will. The third thing we can do is we can divide sin. We all do this at some point. <laughs> I do this. This is when we say sin does exist, but it's what other people do. Can we just laugh at ourselves and say we do this? I just make mistakes and have problems or I have bad days. But other people have serious problems and sins that they need to come to Jesus about, right? I don't need to repent to my husband because I, if he, I had a bad day at work. And I just kind of read, divide. And when I divide, sin is kind of the thing other people do, and I'm always kind of ending up in that better camp where it's just like, oopsie. Well, we still, it doesn't solve this issue that we have, I would propose. And the fourth thing we can do is we can drown in sin. And this is where we believe sin exists, but Jesus doesn't truly cleanse us. This is where we say, I know sin exists. I know I have sinned. And Jesus can forgive and cleanse and purify everyone else, but if you know what I did... And we don't believe he truly cleanses us. We believe we kind of have to pay for it. We believe we've got to believe in Jesus plus those jars of purification to somehow deal with the shame and the impurity that we feel. So what do we do? We can deny it. We can redefine it. We can divide over it. We can feel like we're drowning in it. But I want to say to you this morning that John recorded a story for us to point us to a sign, a signal that if we look over at Jesus, if we look at Jesus, he doesn't minimize the problem, but the one who defines the problem can be trusted to purify us and solve the problem. And he takes those ways in which we try to solve this problem and says, if you trust in my ability to forgive you, I not only forgive you, but I cleanse and I purify what you feel this sin has done to you. 
I can make it right. You see, sometimes I think we think that shame and guilt is kind of the problem and that religion or the Christian faith just kind of peddles in shame and guilt and burdens people. But I want you to think about this. Shame and guilt can actually be gifts. Consider this. The shame and guilt can be a gift because these can actually be appropriate feelings to when we have violated a standard or have been disconnected from the one whom we want to belong to. That feeling when we have done something, whether your own standard or God's, and that sense of kind of shame and guilt, oh, that's not who I want to be. That's not all bad. That feeling is meant to drive us towards Christ who can purify us and give us a way out. The opposite of that, saying, oh, shame and guilt are always bad, the goal is saying the goal is to be a shameless society. You don't want to be a shameless, live in a shameless society, do you? Or people are like, I just do what I do and don't burn me about it. Do you want to work with people like that? Nobody does. There is a healthy sense of where we feel the shame and guilt and it turns us and says, oh, this isn't what I was created for. Oh, this is wrong and I want to live in this other way. And we bring it to God and he can cleanse us and he purifies us and he does it in a moment and he does it through his grace. Now, there is a bad shame and guilt. And there is shame and guilt is harmful. And that is when it is confused with having low self-esteem or self-loathing or felt worthlessness. No matter what you have done, no matter what sin you have committed, it does not change your value before God. There is nothing you can do to make you any less valuable to him. And so that shame we experience that causes us to feel like I am not worth anything, like I, that self-loathing, that's not from God. That's not from God. But that conviction and that twinge of shame that says, hey, you were created for something else, and you were called to walk in a different way. We respond to that and bring that to our loving Jesus. Now, let me just pause for a moment. Because as I was praying for you guys, I pray for you as I'm preparing these sermons. And I was thinking about Jesus as our purifier and our cleanser. And thinking about this whole idea of the shame that we feel, the healthy and unhealthy. I could not help but think of how many people are drowning in the shame of sexual sin. And we need a perspective that is from above. Jesus says that he is from above. And so he defines for us what sin is, and he defines for us how sin is dealt with. He gives us a way out. I recently read a book about sexual shame. I disagreed with about 95% of what the book says. But I like to read books I disagree with. I'm weird that way. The book basically said the problem with the teaching on sexual morality is that it makes people feel shame and guilt. And so the goal is just to not feel that about anything you do. And I want to say that we need a perspective that is from above, who defines what the problem is and brings the cleansing that we need. At the end of the book, she had this worksheet that you could do in order to free yourself from shame and guilt in the area of sexuality. And I do want us to be free from that. But she had a worksheet which you could build your own sexual ethic and your own personal morality code in the area of sexuality. And I thought that was the most terrible, burdensome thing I could ever imagine. I really thought it was. Because when we do that, my experience is we still feel it, but we bury it, and the healthy shame and guilt becomes toxic to our souls. 
And God can cleanse us and purify us from the sin that we have committed, even sexual sin. Don't redefine it. Don't redefine sexual sin to escape that feeling. Don't divide over it and minimize your own and magnify others. Don't drown in it. God can purify us. And the thing that makes us sexually pure is not us being perfect. The thing that makes us sexually pure is a person, and his name is Jesus. And no matter what you have done, past, present, or no matter what you do in the future, come to him every time. We are drowning as a people. And I like to think it's out there, but it is in here totally consumed with pornography. You don't have to hide, you can bring it to him. And I know we minimize it, but it is way worse than we admit it to ourselves. But we have a God who turns water into wine. All these ways we're trying to purify ourselves from the shame of sexual sin. We could just be turning to Jesus. And he will bring freedom and peace like you have never imagined. It won't be easy. Obeying Jesus is never easy. But he can do it. He can do it. When it comes to sexual purity, the most important question is not, what have you done? The most important question is, what has Christ done for you? Come to him. Bring it to him. Don't listen to the lives of the world that say, if you just kind of rework it, you'll find freedom. You won't. But if you come to him, you will. Right after this, and Jesus says that he is our purification. We have John 3.16, probably the most famous Bible verse in the American church. Right after this, he says, for God so loved the world. Right after he was talking and showing this example of, hey, that feeling of needing to be purified, that feeling of needing to be cleansed, I know the guilt and the shame. I came not to condemn. I came not because I am angry at you. I came not because I am trying to burden you. I came because I loved you. God died not because he was angry or disappointed in us. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. So what do we do? We do the two things in this story that they showed us to do. When the disciples saw, when the disciples saw what Jesus had done, they believed. And it seems so trivial, but I want to encourage you, whatever that thing is that you are saying, oof, I've been minimizing it. I've been saying my pride is just not that big of a deal. Or I've been redefining things. I've been drowning in it. Believe what Jesus said. And bring it to him. It seems so simple, but there's, it's so powerful that whatever we're carrying, believe that he can do it. Believe that he can purify. Believe that he can make it right. He can. He can and he will if you come to him. If you come to him. And when we believe, it is not just a passive thing. I want to call you to obey him. Obey what he's asked you to do. I love this story and this cap, where they captured this moment with Jesus and his mother, his mother. It said, when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now pause there. When he said to her, woman, it felt about as cold as you can imagine. Just imagine for a moment calling your mother woman. If my children said, woman, what's for dinner? I would say, child, try it again, right? Like that would feel, I'd be like, don't call me woman. And do you know that sometimes God asks us to do things that feel a little challenging, 
that feel like I don't feel like I can see his goodness and what he's asking me to do. I don't feel like I can see the love and care. Sometimes he asks us to do things. When we come to him and want purification from him, we are also committing to obey him, to pursue righteousness, to believe that it's the best. But sometimes it doesn't feel good. Sometimes it feels like Jesus is saying to us, woman, person, this is what I'm asking you to do. But we need in this generation and in this time and for your life more Marys in the world to say, do whatever he asks you to do. Be like Mary. I'll do what you ask me to do because in you is life. In you is cleansing. In you is purification. In you is freedom from my shame. In you, I will be given life and life everlasting. It's gonna cost me something, but in you is everything because the signs pointed me and I've seen and I've tasted and I've experienced. It's true. Even if it feels hard, Jesus, I'm gonna do whatever you ask me to do. I'm not going to play with sin. I'm not going to redefine it, shift it, change it. Your righteousness is life and goodness for me. And when I screw up, I'm going to come to you because you're going to make it right and you're going to cleanse me and I'm not going to have to live with the shame. I'm going to have peace and have closeness with you. Do what he's asked you to do. So where do we go from here? I want to challenge you on something, and I challenge you guys a lot on this, and I'm just going to keep saying it because I believe that every time I say it, a couple of you are going to do it. And it's not a heavy on those who can't. I know how hard this, what I'm going to ask you to do is. There's something you're feeling, that good shame in you right now, that good shame and guilt like, man, there's something I'm dealing with that I need to bring to Jesus and trust him. I want to get rid of these feelings of shame and guilt. I want him to purify me. I want his, to experience his forgiveness. The way we do that, and the way, in my opinion, we experience that most powerfully is when we go to our brothers and sisters in Christ and bring it to them, and together we bring it to God. Scripture actually says to confess your sins to one another. And that in repentance, there's times of refreshing that come. Many years ago, I was working with a woman, and her and I would get together once a month. We'd go for a walk or have coffee. She'd just share with me about her life, and I'd ask her questions. And we'd do this every month. One time, we got together, and we were just going for our monthly walk. And she said to me, Lindsay, I have something I need to tell you. It's really hard. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I said, okay, you can tell me. She said, can we sit down? Oh, okay. So we sit down on a park bench. And she just sat there and just, I could feel the tension and the heaviness. She said, I don't know how I'm going to say the words. And it's, will you just say them? And I know it's not that easy, though. So she actually looked at me and she said, could I turn around and turn my back to you and say it like that? I said, sure. So she literally physically turned her back towards me on the park bench and I sat there and looked at her back Why it just all came pouring out. Nothing too big for Jesus that she said, but man, when you keep it in, it just becomes, it magnifies, and that healthy shame turns into that toxic shame. But you know what happened? Because I couldn't look at her face. As those words came out, her shoulders were like up right around her ears. And it was like her whole body just kind of relaxed. And very quickly, she turned around and she said, that wasn't as hard as I thought. And I feel so much better. Why didn't I tell you this earlier? I said, I feel you. I'm the same way. Go to somebody. Even if you've got to turn your back and say, hey, I'm struggling with something, but I want to bring this to God because I know that he calls us in. 
and I need cleansing, and he can do it, but I want to bring someone in because that breaks that power of toxic shame, and it breaks the power of sin in our lives, and we minister grace to one another. Bring it. This week, bring it. Bring it awkwardly. Bring it in a difficult way. Whatever it is, bring it. If you've been carrying it for five days or five years or 15 years, just reach out to someone and say, this is going to be awkward and hard for me, but I just need to just bring it. This weird preacher lady told me I should do this. And you will experience in your life the God who turns water into wine, the God who purifies and gives us that peace that says, I cleanse you from not just guilt, but all the shame and the impurities. He does it. He's so good at doing it. He's so good, and you don't have to carry it for another day. You don't. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. that there is no one like you. There's simply no one like you. Your love and your grace and your mercy, your cleansing, your purifying. God, I pray specifically for people that are feeling that right now. I can feel them in this room. There's the heavy things they're carrying. God, I pray that you would whisper into their hearts, just bring it to me. Give them the confidence Help them. God, I pray for those specifically carrying sin and guilt and shame in the area of sex and sexual sin. It's not too big for you, Jesus. We know that, but it's hard. Give them confidence. Give people boldness. Give them a name in their mind of someone they should go to this week. Give them a name right now, Jesus, so they can walk forward with that. God, I pray for mercy and grace to follow them all the days of their life and into this week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.